Welcome to the King's Word Bible Study. Today our topic is going to be intervening in prayer. Let's begin today in Ezekiel chapter 22. In Ezekiel chapter 22, beginning in the 23rd verse, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto it, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor reigned upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have dulled them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery, and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed a stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge, and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. This sounds a lot like what we see playing out right before us in our own land. Verse 27 said, Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. Those three things are important, because it's not only the princes and political leaders who indulge in these things. It goes much deeper than that. Dishonest gain is stealing. Shedding blood is killing, and the destruction of souls is destroying. Steal, kill, and destroy. It's that age-old pattern of the enemy. John 10 and 10 in the classic Amplified says, The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. The leaders don't want you to enjoy life, nor do they even want you to have it in the first place. And if you do have it, they want you to be miserable because that's what they are. They want you to be fearful of them because that's how they keep their control. They want to take what rightfully belongs to you. They want to kill your hopes and aspirations, and they want to destroy what you've worked so hard for. They're leading, but they're leading people backwards, away from God, away from prosperity, away from success, and away from what's best for them. They're supposed to be the ones giving people an environment to succeed and prosper in. But they just care about their own success. They want their own prosperity. And the people that they preside over, they just look at it as another vehicle to get them there faster. They'll take the fruit of your labor. They'll take your increase. And they'll empty out your wallet and leave you with nothing. They don't care. They have no morals. They have no working conscience. And they have no shame. That's a sad state of affairs. But what's even worse is that we find the same things happening in the church. Verse 25 says, There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Conspiracy is the first word that we see stick out here. Why would there be a conspiracy amongst the priests of all people? As the ministers of God, that should be the last thing that they were involved in. But what do we mean exactly by conspiracy? In the Hebrew, it means an unlawful alliance, confederacy, treason. The word that it's derived from means to bind together, league together, physically gird, combine, work treason. This shows the serious nature of what we're looking at here. This wasn't a small matter. This changed everything. These aren't ordinary people. These aren't even political people. These are the ministers of God who are supposed to bind themselves to God and have God dwelling within their spirit. So then we have to ask, who were they in league with? Who were they working treason with? Who'd they bind themselves to? We get a hint from the language used in this verse. It should remind us of somebody else. We see that these priests are like a roaring lion devouring souls. So we have to ask, who else is like that? The devil is like that. First Peter 5 and 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. They're in league with the devil. They made a compact with him. They're following his lead, doing what he does, saying what he says, even thinking what he thinks. 
Why would they do that? They do it to work treason. But what's the point of treason? The goal of all traitors, whether they're in the natural or in the supernatural, is to destroy a system, and more specifically, to destroy it from within. That's a foolish goal, especially when coming against the church, which we know the gates of hell itself will never prevail against it. But that doesn't mean that they won't try. They will try, and they'll try a lot. They want to divide and conquer, which is why our unity is so important. That's where we find our power, unity with one another, and unity with God and with His will. They take the treasure and the precious things from people, and that should sound familiar too. That's the biggest criticism that you hear from worldly people that preachers are only in it for the money. There's bad apples on every tree, so of course there will always be those who abuse the trust that God and His people place in them, people who give their hearts over to lust after money. But then there are the countless others who don't do it for money, but do it because they love God and love His people, and we can't forget that they exist. The ones who are only in it for the money, they want to take your treasure. They want to take the precious things that you worked for and that you gained over time because they don't have it within them to get those things for themselves. So they want to take for free what you had to pay a price to get. That's theft, and it's inspired by the one who's always been a thief and a robber. They gird themselves about with this conspiracy. They gird themselves to the enemy. They bind themselves to him. That should stand out too because that's the opposite of what we're called to do as God's children. 1 Peter 1 and 13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The first half of Ephesians 6 and 14 says, Stand therefore, having your loins gird about with truth. They can't do that, because they don't have the truth. That's not a part of their life. It's not a part of their vocabulary. It's not a part of their will to want to spread it. They do the opposite. They spread lies, they spread confusion, misunderstanding, and ignorance because they're working for the father of all lies. They suppress and deflect truth wherever they find it because nothing's more fear-inducing to a liar than the truth. Truth is the exposer of lies, and that's why they refuse to gird themselves with it. If they had done so, they wouldn't have fallen prey to the devil in the first place. The fact that they're following him proves that they never did it for themselves. Yet those are the very people who are supposed to teach us to gird ourselves with truth. It makes no sense. That's not the way that it works. We can't have incompetent people leading us because they without fail, through either lack of experience or lack of knowledge, will lead astray, and that's dangerous for the church. Verse 28 said, And her prophets have dubbed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies under them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord have not spoken. Not only did they not listen to God when he spoke to them, but now they were making up things that he never said as they tried to pass them off to unsuspecting people as authentic words from the Lord. Lies. That's what they were giving people. They weren't dividing truth. They were dividing lies. They were seeing vanity. In other versions, that's translated as false visions. That term in the Hebrew means emptiness. And if you go even deeper, that has the meaning of being a lie. And it also has a connection to moral desolation, guile, and even with idolatry. These weren't real visions. They were seeing nothing. Seeing the concoction of their own natural mind that they were passing off to be a vision from the Lord. But why would they do that? They wanted to help out the princes, who would in turn help them out. They wanted one hand to wash the other, creating an entire system of corruption between church and state. It's no different today than what was going on with ancient Israel. It's the same dynamic. Today we find false prophets backing up and encouraging crooked politicians, all for the mutual benefit of everybody involved. All the while, the people that they're both charged with leading are the ones that are left disenfranchised and left out in the cold. They don't care because they're taken care of. Everybody else is just an afterthought. The prophets, instead of doing what they were called to do and calling out the princes for falling far short of what God demands and expects from them, instead support them. The term untempered mortar in other versions is translated as whitewash. That's what they're doing. They want to give them the appearance of being great men, honorable men, men with unimpeachable characters, men with a great moral compass and a great heart for the people. All the while, nothing could be further from the truth. It's all lies, all deception. Verse 26 told us, Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. This is another serious accusation for the ministers of God. 
They're not making the proper distinction between the holy and the unholy. They're not making the proper difference between the clean and the unclean. So what does that actually mean? That means that they're falling prey to that age-old spirit of inversion, which is always a hallmark of the devil's playbook. Isaiah 5 and 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. All that that shows is that they have no spiritual discernment, or at least if they do have it, they're not using it. It's far worse to have the gift and then not use it than to never have had it at all. But yet that's exactly what we find here. The ministers violated the law. They went against it. They saw a new God's will. They knew his word. They knew his perfect and holy standards and then discarded them and ignored them. And they went their own way. They followed their own carnal mind and fleshly nature. Then since they're the leaders in charge of shepherding over the flock of God's children, the sheep see the shepherd doing that and many start to go that way too. They also close their eyes to the Sabbath. What does that mean? That implies that this was done in willful ignorance. It wasn't that they didn't understand the significance or the importance or the necessity of a day of rest that's given in devotion to God as the first fruits of our week. It's that they knew all that but didn't care. That didn't suit them, so they ignored it and decided that they were going to do things on their own terms. They, in turn, greatly weaken the faith of themselves and their people as they lead people astray. It's their lack of doing their job properly that leads to what we find in verse 29. It told us, The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Who taught them to do that? Who'd they see living like that? How else are people expected to conduct themselves when even the spiritual leaders are acting this way? That doesn't make it okay or permissible, but at the very least, it makes it understandable. We don't want that to be our story. So what do we do? How do we fix this? We find the answer in verse 30. It said, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. In the Living Bible it says, I looked in vain for anyone who would build again the wall of righteousness that guards the land, who could stand in the gap and defend you from my just attacks, but I found not one. In the King James we see that phrase, but I found none. That's one of the saddest phrases in all of scripture. In all of Israel, amongst the hundreds of thousands of men, many of whom were probably good, faithful, God-fearing men, there wasn't one single man who was willing to stand in the gap for the land. The Lord's making the same call today. He's looking for somebody to stand in the gap for the land. So we have to ask ourselves, are we going to be the one who steps up? But what does it actually entail to stand in the gap? What does standing in the gap look like? What does rebuilding the wall of righteousness entail? One thing amongst many others that we need to do in the gap is pray. Second Chronicles 7 and 14 says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Last week we looked at the importance of humbling ourselves, but now we need to look at the importance of prayer. We all know that we need to pray. We all know that that's one of the most powerful assets that we have in this life. We know that it's conversation with God, the way that we commune with Him. But what is it beyond that? What does prayer actually mean? In the Hebrew, it means to intervene, to interpose. This is what we're called to do. This is what the Lord expects us to do. And this is what prayer requires us to do. When the country is being destroyed, when the church is being infiltrated by the enemy, when your life is being overrun by the enemy, what are you going to do? Are you just going to sit on the sidelines and watch the enemy run wild, stealing, killing, and destroying everything in sight while you hope and pray that somebody at some time may do something about it? Or are you going to stand up and stand in the gap? Are you going to be the one who refuses to let him do what he intends to do? That's why the devil doesn't want you to pray. He doesn't want you to intervene in the situation. He wants you to stay out of it. He usually does that by fear. That's one of the main ways. Fear manifests itself in many different ways. That could be fear that your prayer won't make any difference. Fear that it will retaliate if you pray. Or fear that the situation is hopeless. He wants to keep you silent because he wants to keep you powerless. We can't let that happen though. We know his playbook. We know that prayer changes things. And that's not just an old song that we sing. That's what God's word tells us. 
Instead of complaining about the state of the country, instead of complaining about churches watering down the word of God, instead of complaining about having to continually face the attacks of the enemy, we should do something about it. We should pray. If you don't like the crime taking over your community, if you don't like the evil that's being taught in our schools, if you don't like the lack of knowledge of God amongst our land, we need to do something about it. We need to intervene. We need to interpose ourselves in the situation by praying and taking a stand for God, no matter what the enemy, no matter what the culture, no matter what anybody else around us may have to say about it. That means that we intentionally place ourselves between the current state of things as they are and the destruction that we want to prevent. It means that we build the wall of righteousness back up by standing in the gap, filling in the void, being the difference that we're believing to see. We can't change other people and we'll never change the enemy or his plans. All we can change is ourselves. All we can do is what we're called to do. All we can do is use the assets that he gave us to use. That's why we have to pray. That's so we can change the situation. That's so we can change the country. That's so we can change the state of the church. But it all starts with us. It's not going to start from the top down because the people at the top don't want change. It has to start from the bottom up. And that's especially true in the church. Frank Bartleman once said, A revival always begins among the laity. The ecclesiastical leaders seldom welcome reformation. History repeats itself. The present leaders are too comfortably situated as a rule to desire innovation that might require sacrifice on their part. And God's fire only falls on sacrifice. An empty altar receives no fire. It starts with us, the people of God. Leaders are always a reflection of the people that they lead. Corrupt leaders are at worst a reflection of bad people and at best a reflection of misled and deceived people. Good leaders are always a reflection of good people, which is why when the hearts and the minds of people begin to change under the mighty hand of God, when they humble themselves, when they pray, when they seek God and turn from their wicked ways, and when they make up their mind to take a stand and stand in the gap, then we'll find that God raises up leaders who do the same. So then we have to ask, what's it like in the gap? A gap is a big empty space. What that means for us is that when we're standing in the gap, we're probably going to be all alone. The people that we work with won't understand it. Our neighbors won't understand it. And even our family may not understand it. But that's okay because we know what we're doing and why we're doing it. We know that we're taking a stand for what's right, taking a stand to change our land for the better. It may be tough to be all alone in the gap. Then there's nobody around us to lean on, nobody to help us when we start to get weary. But we know that we always had the Lord there with us. He never leaves and never forsakes us. And as long as we have Him, we'll have all the strength that we need to go on and to keep standing. That's what makes the difference with people who prevail. They persevere. They persist. Ephesians 6 and 13 says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. It's hard enough to stand. But then it gets even far more difficult to stand after having done all the stand. That means having gone through all the attacks, having gone through all the betrayal, having gone through all the hurt, all the insults, all the injuries from people who didn't understand and even hated what we were doing. That's where you find out who's really dedicated. That's when you find out who's really willing to stand in the gap. And that's when you find out who really wants to be the difference that they want to see. The gap is also an undesirable place. Nobody wants there to be a gap in something. That's just something that we tolerate. That means that we're going to be uncomfortable when we're there. But we're doing it for the fact that we can't tolerate it. It needs to be filled. And if nobody else is going to do it, we're going to be the one that fills it. It's not something that we really want to do. It's something that we need to do. That gets to the heart of what standing in the gap actually is. It's an act of agape love. It's self-sacrificial. It's an act of surrender for the greater good. There's few other acts that are more honorable than that. God's calling us to be the Nehemiahs of our time. He's calling us to be the ones that rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. Nehemiah chapter 4 verses 6 to 9 say, So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together under the half thereof. For the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very rough and conspired all of them together to come in to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. We're called to build the wall, but we like Nehemiah and his men need to have a mind to work. 
We need to be ready and willing to make the necessary sacrifices that have to be done. We need to be willing to put our hand to the plow, never looking back. When the devil in the culture starts to see the gaps and the breaches being filled, they're going to get angry. They're going to conspire against us, just like the priest did in Ezekiel's day. But there's no conspiracy that can ever win out over the plan of God. God always has the final say. The wall of righteousness will be built to guard the land again. And all the breaches will be filled as we do our part, as we believe, as we pray, as we seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. We're the ones to do it. We can't wait around for somebody else to do it. We heard the call. We know the call. And we need to answer the call. Our land will be healed when we pray, when we intervene, when we interpose ourselves into the situation by standing in the gap. Let's close in prayer. Lord, today we thank you that you're raising up Nehemiahs in this day that you're raising up men of God who are going to be strong and have boldness and courage, unlike anything that we've ever seen before. Men who are going to be willing to stand in the gap, who are going to be ready for the battle ahead, and aren't going to bend or break to the enemy's oppressions and attacks, but who are going to stand firm. Even after having done all, they're going to keep standing as they persevere and persist. And Lord, we thank you that they're going to prevail. Lord, we know that you're not done with the land, that you're not done with the church, that you still have a purpose and a plan for your people, and that it's great. And Lord, we thank you for the incredible, amazing things that you have ahead for your people. Lord, we thank you that the breaches are being filled. Lord, today we've heard the call, and Lord, we ask for the strength and for the wisdom to answer the call. Lord, we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you want to intervene and stand in the gap and have Jesus as a part of your life today, all you need to do is invite Jesus into your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior. Then you need to repent of your sins and ask for his forgiveness. Then you trust that you've been forgiven and you ask for his free gift of eternal life. Now, if you prayed this from a sincere heart and you truly meant it, then you are now a part of the family of God. Welcome to God's family. We want to thank everybody for listening today. We appreciate you taking out your time to spend with us. If you want even more of the Kingsword, you can go to our YouTube page at Kingsword Ministry, visit our TikTok page at Kingsword Bible, and our Instagram page at Kingsword Bible Study. God bless you. We want you to know that we love you all, and we'll see you next week as we continue to study the Kingsword together.